So here we have uh, Paul's re really prescription for the divisions in the church. Paul's prescription for divisions in the church. He moves back to something that he's already mentioned uh, in chapter 1 uh, from verse 10. Divisions which had resulted as individuals were following particular speakers. I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. I suppose saying today in some circles uh, as Christians we can be, I follow John MacArthur, I follow Mark Driscoll, I follow Joyce Meyer. It doesn't particularly matter, but that's the case that it is, isn't it? And this is what they were doing. Some of them, the, not necessarily the speakers here, because all those particular speakers that we've heard and listed are holy men. Peter, Apollos, Paul, they are not heretics. But the problem wasn't necessarily with these individual speakers, no doubt there were others. But what the problem was, the problem was with them, not with the speakers as such. These ones mentioned anyway. They had caused the problem, the actual Corinthian believers themselves. They had divided Christ and divided the fellow servants, the labourers, and... Um, Paul appeals to them to reconcile. He shows that Christ is not divided and that the preaching of Christ crucified is not about eloquent wisdom because that was the problem. There were others who thought it was all about rhetoric and wisdom and philosophy and the thinking of the age. But it's not, none of those sins, simply a declaration of Christ crucified, which is folly to those who are perishing. The message of Christ crucified is foolishness to the world. That's why the church is not full. That's why we're not building an extension on one side and the other side. Because if it was the wisdom of the world, the world would be here. But it's the wisdom of God. And it's folly uh, to the world. But it is the power of God and the wisdom of God to those who are being saved. 1 Corinthians 1.18 And then in this, these chapters that we've gone through, he's gone on to contrast the wisdom of man and the age and the wisdom of God. And he's further contrasted it in chapter 2, talking about the natural man, that one devoid of the spirit, and the spiritual man who has the spirit. And the revelation of the deep things of God is given to him or to her. And now in chapter 3 he's beginning to deep, dig a bit deeper into their own personal spirituality. In regard to earlier in chapter 2 he was not speaking to the believers. He was contrasting the spirit of the age and the spirit of man. The spirit of the age, spirit of man to the spirit of God and the wisdom of God. Here he's going directly. He's, got, he's scratching where it itches now. He's getting up close and personal. He addresses them together, doesn't he? He's about to get under the skin, but I, brothers. Again, Apostle Paul here is not a man who is aloof and cold and distant and locked himself up in some theological and doctrinal tower. He's not a person who just likes to stick the oar in where it's not wanted. He is spiritually fathered, these uh, Corinthian believers. They were birthed from his ministry. He loves them. His heart is for them. He's all out towards them. He addresses them as brothers once again. That Greek word Adelphi, as siblings, they belong. They are family members to him. And so, despite the unjust criticisms, criticisms that he has personally received, from family and siblings in Christ, he has still got a heart and concern for them, and he doesn't brush them off. He really does care. He doesn't just wander off, I can't be doing with this Corinthian lot anymore, I'm off to Ephesus. No, he writes to them, he loves them, he cares for them. And he says, but I, brothers, again, here is his apostolic authority, but I, brothers... We've got to remember Paul is the apostle, he's the, he founded this church. He's speaking as a leader to them. It's important to know here that our leaders are given to us to shepherd the flock, to lead us out of danger, to, get, to lead us from error, to teach and to train, 
to encourage, to challenge and to disciple in order that we are mature in Christ as the body of Christ. And we need as a body to have a right understanding of spiritual leadership. We are all fellow workers, but we all have different roles within that context. It's easy to resent those who have spiritual oversight over us. Especially like here when, like Paul, they are addressing behaviour and attitudes which are fleshly. It's so much easier for a leader to ignore a problem. To just brush it under the carpet. But that's wrong. And for a brother to ignore the loving concern. Or fail to submit to spiritual oversight. To simply walk away from a leader. Or to malign the leader. But walking away from the church. Just simply means your problem goes with you to another church. And we see that happen. In church. Not just this church. All churches. Again and again. But here we don't see these believers walking away. They are, this letter is coming to them and they are listen, listening to it. Hebrews 3.17 tells us that we are called to obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping a watch over your souls. That's what Paul is doing here. As those who will have to give an account... Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. We are also called to respect our leaders amongst us, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, 13, to esteem them highly in love. Our leaders are a gift to the church, Ephesians 4, 11, 12, whom Christ has given for the church, so that the church might be brought into maturity in Christ's likeness. Having said that, we are all fellow workers, we are all servants, but with differing roles. And we are called, all of us, and our leaders, to submit to one another. To submit to one another. Corinthians were spiritual, but were acting fleshly here. Have I got the right page? Yeah. The irony here is that the very ones setting themselves up as super spiritual are elevating the, and elevating the claims of others over the apostle and others were indicating by their very actions that they were still babies and acting in the flesh. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. So these are spiritual people. These are people who Christ has died for and who've, who they've trusted in Christ, but they are acting as infants. They are acting as, they are having tantrums and throwing the, the rattle out of the, co the, the cot as it were. <coughs> They're still in the nursery because of their flesh, fleshly behaviour. It's not like the contrast area of the natural and the spiritual. These are spiritual people. Calvin says that Christ is milk for infants and strong meat for men. Remember that every doctrine that is taught to a theologian is taught to a child. We must be communities who are fully nourished. 1 Peter 1 2, like newborn babies, crave the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. We must never consider that somehow that we have arrived, that we don't need Christ crucified, that we have gone on to superior things. These fit people were thinking themselves as super spiritual, but actually they were infants. These people were thinking that, that they were mature, but were babies in Christ. And it was shown by their behaviour in the community at Corinth. Babies are prone to tantrums, aren't they? Outbursts, fits of jealousy and rage. Easy to get distracted. Not retaining their identity in Christ and who they are in Christ and what Christ has done for them and the life of Christ that lives in them, that they are a new creation, that the old has gone and the new has come. They're going back and manifesting this fleshly, earthly nature. 
Instead of allowing their Christian, new creative, Christian nature change their old nature, they're allowing the old nature to eat away at the new nature. These are people of the flesh, Paul calls them, this Greek word sarkonis. It comes from the word sarcophagus, which literally means body eater. When the body was put into a limestone uh, tomb, it would, the, the lime would eat away at the body. And so the fleshly nature is eating away at the new nature. And they're allowing that to have preeminence. They're acting in a human way, a natural way. That's why the church is not natural, it's supernatural, it's spiritual, it's, it's all of God's. There isn't like, we can't like turn and attack, I'm going to act naturally now, and then I'm going to act spiritually. It's the sort of thing like, you know, we've just had a church meeting, we say oh, it's a church business meeting. It's not just a natural business meeting, like a scout's business meeting, or any other business meeting. It is spiritual. It is of God. And the behaviour should be as such, spiritual, at all times. The fleshly nature, we see it in the church. When there's bad behaviour, things are going on. Immorality. Jealousies, rivalries, drunkenness. Those things going on in the church are fleshly. It's not spiritual. It's not what God intended. It's not to be. It's like watching a trapeze show. It's breathtaking, isn't it? We wonder at the dexterity and timing. We gasp at the near misses in most cases. But in most cases, there's a net underneath that catches the trapeze artist. And when they fall, they jump up and bounce back onto the trapeze straight away. And they attempt the same thing that they just failed. And they succeed until they succeed. And so we should be. Yes, we will fall. And yes, we will fall down on the net. But we must get back up. We must get back up. And we must do that which Christ has done. And follow him. People should watch us as Christians, and they don't, but what do they do? Oh, look at that. No different to the world. No different. They should say, look how they live. Look how they love one another. Look how well the husbands treat their wives. And aren't they the best workers in the factories and the offices? Aren't they the best neighbours and the best students? That is to live on the trapeze. Being a show to the world. But when we slip, of course the net is there. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ has provided forgiveness for all our trespasses. Both the net and the ability to stay on the trapeze are works of God's grace. Of course. But we cannot be continually sleeping on the net. If that is the case, I doubt whether a person is a trapeze artist at all. If we're continually found manifest in the flesh, are we even infants in Christ? Surely after this reprimand, as it were, this letter from Paul, this speaking of, surely they, they got it in order. They corrected it. And they sorted uh, the problem out. <coughs> well, Paul directs them to, he gives them the uh, diagnosis, the problem, and here he exposes the symptoms, doesn't he, of the problem, verse 3. The symptoms, for you are still of the flesh, for while there is jealousy and strife among you. Jealousy and strife. Jealousy and strife. I remember prior to the transition of the Labour Party from Blair to Brown, and I'm sure you do as well, all the in-house squabblings and jealousy between Blair and Brown. You had the Brownites and the Blairites. And then all the factions that, that, that go along. And it all, it all come out. It's all there in the media, in the conference speeches. And all the, the party politics. And it, it's escalated. As a church, we should know better. And the current church should know better because... 
It is the wisdom of God, the character of Jesus that we are uh, to show forth. Not the, the characteristics of the will, not the characteristics of the flesh. We are to kill that. Christ crucified it. We are dead to sin, the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans, and we should no longer live in it. It is dead. It is finished. It is an old nature. It is buried in the, gro in the grave, and it is dead and buried and gone. So what is it doing back up in the church? When we find ourselves with jealousy and strife, we need to take a, a spiritual check of ourselves. And ask the Lord for his forgiveness. And come before him, our Lord. And seek him. We should always be examining ourselves. In our uh, attitudes and our actions. They should have known better. Aligning themselves with these individuals caused jealousy and strife. Galatians 5.19 tells us about the fleshly nature, doesn't it? 5.19, 5.19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Will not. These infants were making idols of men. Idolatry, weren't they? In the natural world, both Greek and Jewish roots, a disciple sat under a particular teacher, whether philosophical or religious. These teachers would often be idolised by the students. They followed them exclusively. I follow. I follow Paul. I follow Cephas. I follow Jesus. It's notable that in the culture of the day, a teacher had to be given loyalty by the pupil. They were idolised. These, these, these are uh, X-factor preachers, aren't they? Of the day, you know, they're idolising them. Uh, and this is of the world. We, we, we make things idols. Things that are, are created rather than the creator. It is the creator we should worship and bow down to, not the created, not the person, not the object. And that's what was, was happening. John Calvin wrote about our hearts, that our hearts are idol factories. Our hearts are idol factories. And that's what is taking place here. They're worshipping and idolising these individual communicators of the gospel. And, you know, it wasn't their fault. It wasn't the communicator's fault. It was the, the people who were following them. And the church is not excluded, is it, from idolatry? In fact, we are just as prone. We are guilty of idolising gifted communicators. We're... Uh, prone to worshipping the act of worship and not the one in whom we worship. We're guilty in displaying gifts that uh, we worship and supernatural powers. We are guilty of worshipping relics and places. We're guilty of worshipping spiritual experiences. All these things can become the centre of our worship. They become an idol. We become guilty of substituting what God has given to bring glory to him to become the means of the centrepiece of our worship. The Corinthians had dethroned God from his rightful place. Their hearts were idol factories. They replaced God with the gospel of men. It was their own doing too. And so Paul, who was one of those men, who had been put on a pedestal and then they were throwing bricks at him to knock him down, sought to be pushed up. He writes out now a prescription which deals with their sickness. And the prescription is this. Look, we see in verse 5. From verse 5. Here's the prescription. We've seen the diagnosis. They're infants. They're fleshly. We've seen the symptoms, jealousy and strife. And their, and their problem, idolatry. And the Apostle Paul now prescribes the Corinthians with spiritual understanding on leadership. 
Leaders are servants, aren't they? Verse 5. That's all they are. Should come in here with a tea towel, but we haven't got a tea towel even in the kitchen. But that was my plan. But, uh, uh, there was a preacher who always carried a, a towel into the pulpit. Because he just, to remind him that he's a servant. That he doesn't become puffed up with his own uh, arrogance and uh, leadership and lord it over the flock. He's a servant. He's a fellow servant who has been given spiritual oversight. Leaders are servants, isn't it? Verse 5. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as a Lord assigned to each. <coughs> so Paul is revealing that Apollos and Paul and Cephas are not competing in God's hands. They're fellow. They're yoked together. They are simply servants like waiters who come and serve upon us. When we go to a restaurant for a meal, they come and serve. But they don't serve physical food, they serve the spiritual food so whereby uh, we grow who are called on by God for a particular task, isn't it? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth so there's just servants what is important is that they are just instruments through whom they have believed. It's the surgeon who, who uses the instrument and saves a life. The instrument just partakes in it. it. It alone cannot save anybody. The instrument, the knife, the scalpel, the wrench, or whatever it might be, it hasn't got the power to do anything. It is the surgeon who does the operation through whom they have believed. Could you imagine you just had a triple heart bypass? God forbid. But you've just had a triple heart bypass and you're recovering and, you, and you're thinking, yeah, and the doctor's coming round and the surgeon and, and the surgeon's there and you just, you know, you just go, and where are the instruments? Where's the knife that you used? Where's the scalpel? I just want to give thanks to the scalpel. No, you want to give thanks to the surgeon, thanking him for it. And you want to give, Paul say, it's no good putting these guys on a pedestal and, and praising them and giving thanks to them. You want to thank God. It's God. We're just fellow servants. We're just instruments that God has used, that God has taken up. Who have you believed? God is alone the source of truth. He has imparted the grace and salvation. And God should receive all the glory. So God alone brings the growth. And Paul knows that, doesn't he? Verses 6 to 7. Van Tavner said, our efficiency, however good we are, however efficient we are, without God's sufficiency is only a deficiency. Our efficiency without God's sufficiency is only a deficiency. And then in verse 9, he says, look, we're not only just servants, we're not only just instruments, it is God who brings the growth, it's all about God, but not only that, we serve together. You're, you're dividing us and we're not divided. For we are God's fellow workers. We're together. In this work. And so all this has caused divisions in the church. But a church is to be together. We are together. As fellow workers. Look, God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's <laughs> building. And we are God's workers in that field and in that building. We are on the same team. So get it together, he's saying. Like in a relay race, there's the anchor man, there's this, the, the man who runs, the sprint man. We are together, we are passing the baton on, we are working together. Important to note here in verse 8... Notice that, what he says. For we are God's fellow work, verse 8, sorry. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labour. You notice that? That is really encouraging. Whether we're working in a barren wilderness where there's nothing coming out of the harvest, or we're working in an abundant oasis of people being saved and being transformed, we're not rewarded on our fruitfulness. They're not rewarded on how successful we are. We're rewarded whether we're labouring. That's important. So wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we've just got to keep at it, keep going on and on and on, and never giving up. 
He's got to be like a dog with a bone when it comes to the gospel of Christ crucified. Never give up because it's our labour which God will reward. Not our, not our fruitfulness. None of these guys mentioned ever preached a separate gospel. They all preached the same gospel. They all shared the same divine message. They had complete equality and unity. They were fellow workers with different tasks. One planted, one watered. God gave the growth. But they were together. And so what they were doing, setting one against another, was a perversion of their leadership, a perversion of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in summing up, we all belong to God. Leaders do not own the church. Members don't own the church either. No matter how long they've been part of it. It is God's church. We are but fellow labourers in it. You are his field. You are the building. This is the building. This is the building. The church is here. The people now. This is just but a building. We are the field of God. We belong to God. He will build his church. He brings in the harvest. He laid the foundation and he brings it to completion. Paul, this is Paul's prescription to divisions in the church. He wants them to have a correct understanding of spiritual leadership and oversight. Because they've got it all wrong. Amen. Amen. Right, we're going to sing a hymn.